This is a visual demonstration of some of the homework projects and color studies that I have for my beginning painting classes to do. And uh, we're going to prepare a piece of paper to paint on to do this. You're going to use a piece of watercolor paper that will be taped down to a piece of masonite. You can see on the sticker here that this is 22 by 30 inches, the normal sized sheet. Here I'm showing you that you will probably have a cut down board because I request that you have two by two foot pieces of masonite. So you will need to trim your paper down. And if you trim it down so that it's 22 by 22 inches, then there will be enough room for this tape to go all the way around the edges. I suggest getting the blue painter's tape. Um, you don't want to use packaging tape or most masking tapes because while they will hold the paper down while you're putting the gesso on, they also tend to tear the paper or pull some of it off when you're removing it. So you're going to adhere all four sides. You'll probably want to use um, at least 140 pound paper, maybe even up to like a 300 pound paper because anything with a lighter weight than that will be problematic and will cause excessive buckling after it gets wet. So you'll take your gesso on your clean piece of paper, shake it up, make sure it's all mixed well, and you will start going uh, with two different coats, actually. You'll let one dry and then you'll put another one on. Try to go in just in one direction uh, as you're going. Here you'll notice that I'm taking off little hairs that are coming out of the brush. That means that I'm using a really cheap brush. I show you that on purpose because a lot of students try to get the cheapest one. I would get a fairly nice house painter's brush to use uh, because you won't lose all of those hairs and they won't get stuck in the gesso. Uh, as we go over the surface, you can see if you look really closely that there are little bits of paper that are still showing through that the gesso hasn't completely covered everything. And while it's wet, um, you can see all the buckling and wrinkling that happens. So I let this rest for maybe an hour and a half before I come back and paint back on it. And you see I'm going in the other direction there. Uh, if you don't have two coats on there, two completely dry coats, you're going to have problems when your paint gets onto the surface because it shows up differently when it soaks into the paper as opposed to being just on the gessoed surface. So uh, yeah, go in the other direction here so that you have almost like a little bit of a canvas weave. If you don't want anything but the texture of the paper, then you can definitely use some of the water uh, to make it thinner and it'll be more the texture of the paper instead of the texture of, of the brush strokes of the gesso. So the first thing that I'm showing you here that I'm measuring out is a color mixing chart. I'm doing this as a grid that is made up of one by one inch squares. Um, actually you'll see as I work on this that I end up making a triangle and not a complete square grid. Uh, the reason why is actually the colors will repeat themselves if you uh, do this correctly and you don't need all of the same thing twice on there. You can probably get away with making three quarter by three quarter inch grid if you don't feel like you have enough space on your paper. Um, but the one by one inch works very well on this. Now what we're going to do with this is actually mix each piece or each paint um, one to one. So 50% of the paint will be one color and 50% will be another color. Here I'm writing down the names of the paints uh, on the grid. You can see all the paint is laid out there and I'm doing them in that order. And then I start in the same order going down the sheet. Now it's important to pay attention to that because that's going to come up later as to why you shouldn't do it exactly that way. Okay, so the first one I did was just white by itself because it connected on the X and Y axis. The next one over is 50% white and 50% the first color, which I believe is burnt sienna. Notice how thoroughly I am cleaning out the paintbrush. I cannot emphasize enough how much you need to clean out your brush after every single mixing that you do. And you'll notice I'm not even mixing that much. I'm just mixing enough to fill in the little square. You don't need to have excess amounts. The reason that you have to clean your brush out so thoroughly is if there is any residue of any of the previous color, 
it's going to mix in with the new color that you're doing and it won't be the correct color. You want these to be as pure as they possibly can be. So if you're at exactly 50% of each color, then you're going to have a higher intensity of color. If you get any bits of these other colors in there, it's going to dull it down, make it more neutralized, and it won't have the same vibrancy that you're seeing here. Also, you won't get a true sense of how one color impacts another one, and that's really why we're doing this. That way we can see which color of the two is stronger uh, which has more tinting strength to it. And uh, so as we go through all of these, you'll, you'll see that it is starting to repeat. And I, I made enough um, of each of these colors that I could put it in two boxes. So there that I mixed green with white, one of the greens with white, and there I'm putting the other box of it in there. But you're starting to sense that something is going to happen as we go down the edge of this, as we get into the next uh, set of greens that I'm going to be filling in here, I'm not able to mix the new green with the last green that I just put on there. So I'm missing my colors. Um, I'm not getting a, a mixture of all of them. So what happened here is if you split it down that way, that's where it repeated. It's a mirror image of itself. So I made these extra little grids over on the bottom and to the side. Now you don't have to do this if you do it the correct way, but um, that will have the remainder of the colors and they're not going to repeat in there. So what you don't want to do that I showed you originally is to make the colors start um, going down in the same direction that they went from left to right. So instead, start with what was your right end at the top and go down toward what was on the left end. That way you will only have one half of the colors in the triangle. If you think that this is really confusing, then you are more than welcome to do the whole square and you shouldn't have any problems with that. It's just that you will repeat the whole thing. But when you do them the way that I did originally on here, you'll see that they do repeat themselves. Um, so I'm into all the blues and the greens here. Again, mixing them one to one. Um, you'll also notice that I change the water often as I am cleaning these out. It's not just that I'm cleaning the brush one time uh, and then I just leave the water dirty and keep doing that. Throughout the time of when you're painting, you have to constantly be getting new water to be able to clean your brush out in. Uh, Otherwise, you're going to have that same problem with the lowered intensity, and you're not going to get the true effect of what these paints do to each other. You will be able to use this as a reference when you're doing your regular paintings. Okay, now we're moving on to the color wheel. If you paid attention through the several hours that it probably took you to do the grid, you'll notice that we have multiple reds, multiple blues, multiple uh, yellows and there's a reason for that because they aren't really pure colors and so to mix this color wheel I just put two yellows down there and I marked what all the colors are um, on the wheel yours doesn't have to be quite that big um, I'm, I'm showing you something else on here but I mixed both of those yellows together to get more of the actual yellow that is on the color wheel that I gave you um, so you're going to match to the colors that are on that color wheel and it's not likely that you're going to be able to go right off of one of the tube colors. So there I'm doing the same thing with red. I'm mixing to get a primary, which is kind of counterintuitive, um, but you have a cadmium red, which is more orange, so it's warmer, and you have um, probably a lizarin crimson or this is I think uh, quadacridone magenta or something, and it's cooler. It's more toward the purple side. And when I mix them together, I get more of just a primary red, and that's, that's what I'm putting down on there. You can't just squirt out one color of one of your reds or one of your yellows or your greens or your blues and have it be the color that is on the color wheel. They don't really come that way. So this is a way to help you learn how to mix things together. And so I will I will often talk to you about, you know, what is your warm blue or what is your cool blue? What is your warm yellow? What is your cool yellow? 
Um, in this, you'll notice that the the cool yellow as you, as you go through these things, the one that's kind of more greenish, is the one that is uh, with lemon or Hansa in the name. Okay, here I'm mixing my pre-mixed blue and red, my primary colors. And when I look at it, it's nothing close to what the actual violet is. It actually comes out as kind of a gray. Um, so even after you've mixed them at that point, you're going to have to go to your secondary colors and kind of remix those out of your paints as well. And you'll get something that is much more um, the color that you were looking for instead of mixing what the primary mixes were. Um, so you realize that these, these colors are not as pure as you would have them be and not as pure as what you think they are going to be. Um, th the same thing happens with the greens. And uh, as, you, as you finish this up, you'll see um, that you kind of have to work at getting the color to be exactly what you want it to be. It doesn't come out as easily from the tube as you would think that it is. Now I'm leaving this section in the middle and I'm going to do something that you do not have to do, but I just wanted to show you what the effect was. And you don't have to make your color wheel nearly as large as what this is. Through all of these projects, you're going to find that um, it takes a lot longer than you would think that it is. Give it that time. Give it the several days that it may take so that you understand this as well as you can. Um, so what I'm doing right here is mixing the two complements that are across from each other with each other so you can see what a complement, how it has an effect on its other other complements. So there I'm, I was doing blue and orange and they end up being these interesting kind of grays but where there's more orange and then more blue in between. And again, you don't have to do this part. The final segment that I'm showing you is kind of glazing experiments. Right there on the paper is already dried stripes of each of the tube colors of paint. Right now I'm getting out the glazing medium. Uh, which comes out kind of milky white, but uh, it will dry clear when it mixes with the paint and when it's when it's completely dry. So each of the colors that is represented there is going to be painted over the top of the already dry colors, but with the glazing medium. The exception is that I didn't put white down because it would just look the same as the, the gesso is. So what I'm doing is, again, it's that 50-50 mixture that we did when we did the um, the color chart before, the mixing chart, but here you're mixing 50% of the glazing medium with another 50% of whatever the color is. You'll do one stripe of that and then the mixture that you have left you will mix another new 50% in of the glazing medium so you'll have it more diluted in that one. So the one stripe is already on there with the white. Make sure you have an accurate 50-50 uh, one part to one part again and then you do the next one over there. It'll probably be a little more opaque when you first put this down before it completely dries. Once it's dry you'll be able to see what it really should look like. So then I'm going to do that with the different reds again. The 50-50 and then another 50% more of the medium in there so that it will create more transparency for each of these colors uh, that you have as tube colors. What will become apparent as you do this entire project is that some of your colors have much more opacity to them. So they will be much more opaque to begin with. Um, and then there's others that are just much more naturally transparent. So um, you don't need to add, um, in a painting, you wouldn't need to add as much of the glazing medium to these. You're also going to see um, how each color and glaze over another color impacts the color below so that you have an idea of how your paint is going to alter other colors. That's the main reason for doing this uh, and to prepare yourself for understanding how the colors are going to impact colors that have already been laid down in the glazing process for when you do uh, those paintings. And of course you need to make sure that you write down what each of your colors are here on each side.